the games that I had the most fun working on are the ones that either didn't come out or did the worst, <laughs> right? I love Planet Side to death. If people ask me to, to, to this day, what's my favorite game? I say Planet Side, but that game was broken. Hey there, Funsmiths. If you've ever thought to yourself, ah, I wish I could get paid to play video games all day. And you might have even seen an ad on the internet suggesting that QA work is perfect. You just sit around and play games. Well, let's get the truth from someone who's actually done it for 20 years. Now, QA is a fully fledged discipline with its own skill set, insights, and talents. And while having quality checking skills is an essential part of being a game designer, it's not just playing games. Furthermore, deeply understanding what a QA team member does is essential to being an effective game designer. So that's what we're gonna learn about today through our conversation with the very talented Ryan Trost. Now, Ryan is a veteran of the video game industry with over 20 years of experience, spending his time at Sony helping QA games such as Star Wars Galaxies, EverQuest Online Adventures, and Planetside. Now, later he moved on to Blizzard, where he worked as a QA lead and even helped produce the very fun BlizzCon. In this episode, we go in-depth with Ryan on his time as a QA tester, the challenges of said position, and what he thought were some of the best lessons he's learned throughout his career. These days, though, Ryan is focused on concept art, which may sound like a big 180, but Ryan explains how his work in the industry has helped him get where he is today. Now, Ryan is an incredibly thoughtful and well-spoken person, and I just know you're going to love this episode. And if you do, please make sure to like and share the video as we'd really appreciate your support here. Enjoy this video, friends. Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Sorry. Well. Yeah. How are you? I am doing really well. I just got a pink gamer chair, so I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> It looks incredible. I can see it in the background, and I've been admiring it since uh, <laughs> its appearance. Thank you. I built it this morning. <laughs> yeah, it's a statement. <laughs> it looks really comfy, too. I, Absolutely. Yeah. I actually got this one that I'm sitting in here last year. I looked about in my chair, and I'm like, this thing is wrecked and terrible, and it is time for me to have one that's actually supportive. It makes all the difference in the world to have a great high back chair. So... Dude, it's, yeah, I I went the, I have been spoiled by these Aeron chairs for far too long. And so I still sit in it like a little gremlin. <laughs> and so like <laughs> the ergonomics are probably lost entirely, but it feels good. Do you ever do the Ryuzaki, <laughs> right? Where you do the Ur. Yeah, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Maybe only in like the worst bouts of anxiety. Mm. <laughs> but for the yeah. most part, uh, you you just kind of find yourself in awkward positions regardless whenever you're gaming or uh, sitting around the computer. I have seen many posts about people who sit like a shrimp is what I see it called <laughs> on the internet. The shrimp, exactly. shrimp pose sitting <laughs> yeah. where you're just totally like curled up in on yourself. Yeah. So I'm sure many people can relate to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. Well, uh, Ryan, it's great to have you here. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, so we're looking forward to hearing all about, you know, uh, your journey into art and the cool sort of, you know, work you do now. Um, but start us off with kind of uh, the beginning. Like, where was your first moment where the light went on? You're like, I want to work in games. Uh, so that's, um, I don't think that really happened for me, which is probably relatively unique. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky in that my uncle is Bill Trost, who was one of the original creators of EverQuest. Um, so MMOs are kind of in my blood, um, EverQuest being one of those sort of foundational, like online experiences. It also happened to release right around when I graduated high school. Um, so that, that kind of also ages and dates me a little bit. I'm about to be 40 as of next month. Um, happy birthday. So thank yeah, you very much. Uh, I don't feel any different. In some ways, which and I feel I feel more mature, way in some ways, but I don't feel a lot different than I ever have. So um, it's a it's bizarre. It's a bizarre annual. 
Uh, but so um, as a result of Bill working at Sony, uh, I, on a sort of whim on a high school, like after like weekend went down with a buddy down to San Diego, um, which is my hometown and met up with Bill and Bill took me around the studio and that was my first time in a gaming studio, right? It was my first time in an I've never been, been in an office. So I don't even know what an office looks mm-hmm. like, right? Let alone like a, a gaming studio. So like it was, I mean, it was Candyland. It was exactly what I dreamed it was going to be. And there were toys all over the place and they were making incredible art and they were um, building essentially like what was going to be my dream game, which was, if you remember the game Tribes, Mm-hmm. Um, it was a first-person shooter that had a lot of team-based mechanics that also had some... Um, there was elements of, like, persistence to it. Um, and ski. Right? Yeah, I was about to and say skiing. Skiing is what you, yeah, everyone you remembers. You can't tribes. ignore that, right? Um, so the, the lead designer of Tribes was working on a game at SOE at the time called Planetside, and they needed testers. And I hadn't no idea what that exactly meant, but I had been playing MMOs and essentially testing MMOs since the mud days. Um, Hardcore Ultima online player, hardcore griefer, hardcore exploiter, like in whatever systems and whatever (laughs) games you can find, right? And it was just the sort of teenage fun thing to do, whether it was like troll in IRC or troll in Ultima online, it was the same same thing, (laughs) like, um, yeah. And yeah, I think that there's a, a strong connection between the people who enjoyed breaking games and the people who enjoyed getting into QA and tr- basically yeah. doing that. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it, and people are going to pay me oh, for it yeah. this time. Yeah, you're going to pay me to break this. Like, I I was doing this already, so like because this <laughs> is how I get better stuff than everyone else. Um, mm-hmm. So. And, and the detective work that goes into it, the analytical thinking, the analytical mindset, um, I, because of Bill, I think, uh, honestly, getting a role in QA is not terribly hard um, for because it, it's a role that's, that's needed and there's a lot of them available and it's an entry level job. And so I, I'm grateful that Bill kind of set me up for that. Um, And at the same time, though, it was definitely like, he wasn't like, here you go. This is the golden child. Like he put me in the, I was making, I think like $9 an hour living in San Diego. Right. That that's, that's not livable. (laughs) It wasn't a livable wage. It wasn't a livable wage in 2001 and it's not a livable wage now. Um, Yeah. And so as a result of that, I, uh, I fell right into QA and I worked on Planetside, EverQuest Online Adventures, Star Wars Galaxies, and every expansion to EverQuest, as well as like Chronicles of Norath and Lords of EverQuest, which was an RTS game that SOE put out, all in the span of about four years. I, I released all those games, as well as two expansions to Planetside. Um, How old were you at this time when you first started working there? 19. I got kicked oh, okay. out of my first uh, Christmas party for drinking underage. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did Steve work wasn't catch really you? a Whoops. proud moment, but we got an email the following day that all future Christmas parties employees were going to be required to wear wristbands <laughs> oh, for identification. And there was a... Uh, me having to leave Dave and Buster's uh, rapidly with with my friend because they uh, they asked to see my ID and I I just showed it to them and they're like yeah you mm-hmm. you're not old enough to drink I was like oh you can't be in sorry. here <laughs> yeah I don't know what I'm thinking sorry about that um, but yeah so I was really young I was and as a result of that I also made a lot of very immature young sort of choices in terms of how how I behaved in an office environment which at the time in general that it wasn't a true office environment um mm-hmm. in, in any sort of like like what you would assume is the standard 
Yeah. Last week yeah. we had a comment by uh, Travis Day on how I would eat cereal <laughs> at the office and uh, yeah. <laughs> like at my desk <laughs> while working. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just like a lot of people wouldn't expect that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And whereas for me, like that doesn't. That's of course. Like where else do you eat cereal? Yeah. Well, you got to work and keep going, right? You have that. Yeah. You got to keep churning like, mindset. Everyone was pushing you the whole year. I can't. Up eat it in the car because I'm driving mm. and I'm not going <laughs> to eat it before work because I was sleeping. <laughs> so, uh, but. and that, that was a really like, that was a lifestyle that I kind of fell into and adapted into relatively easily because I think a lot of my age was a big part of that. Um, I didn't have a lot of social obligations outside of work. So I was able to do the 70 literal 70 hour weeks that they were requiring. Yeah. Um, and and to be honest, they were the people requiring? Yeah. Oh, ab- oh, oh yeah. yeah. No, there, there's no there's it was so QA um, then and to some degree now is a contract based job. The very few of us who were lucky enough to have long term careers in QA did that because we worked on projects that were um, live projects. They were sustainable, like World of Warcraft or like. Um, like I was mentioning with us. So we usually you go from game to game or like if you're in television, you go from TV show to TV show. So after you finish these long, arduous crunches, you're kind of then uh, sent back home. Um, oh. Yeah. And it... That sounds rotten. It's... I, well, yeah, it is. But it's just the way games have been and were made and still to some degree are made. Um, QA as a whole... I think is a very um, underrepresented and misunderstood part of the development process. Yep. Uh, a lot of people and, just think that QA is the sit there and play the game, but it's actually a lot of, you know, as I said, the sleuthing, communication, no, interacting yeah. with the developers. And, um, it's, you, it's your first user experience mm-hmm. and it's your biggest fan. And so you have, like, because of that, you have some tainted opinions and you have a little bit of, like, poor judgment on QA's part. And you have a lot of immaturity because you're having to hire children because only ch- children in quotes. I, yeah. I consider a 19-year-old a child. Uh, I have a 21-year-old, 22-year-old daughter now, and she's still kind of a kid, kid to me. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, like you feel you have to do these things because if I wasn't there working those hours, they would replace me with someone else who was more than happy to work those hours because Mm. the resumes that they've got on their desk for the next batch of people who want to become a Blizzard designer, that they know that the way in is through QA. So, and my job eventually became going through those, right? And then mentoring those people into those design roles. And I'm really proud to say that a lot of the guys and a lot of girls that I've worked with throughout the years have moved on into some just just amazing positions in companies across the gamut when it comes to whether it's entertainment or uh, just design, games, anything. You want to give any shout outs to some of the peeps who uh, you helped raise? Yeah, Nicole Gillette. Especially, she went on into the, she was at Overwatch, she was running Overwatch hard for a while, then she went to, uh, I think she was, what, what's the bike company, the exercise bike company. Oh, Peloton? Yeah, she was yeah. Peloton, and she was their art director for a bit, and now she's on with the startup, and just crushing it, all while being like a new mother as well. Yeah. So, wow. things, have, yeah. things have shifted a little bit in since 2002, right? Just a little. Yes, a little bit. Uh, Tina Fu, I think, who's now, um, who's she with? I think she's with Diablo. Uh, Tiffany Watt, who is also, I think, now executive production on Diablo. These were all people I hired in QA, like, back yeah. in the day. Um, and it's, I, I love it. I love seeing that. I love seeing, like, posts from, um, I think, it's a, they just got hired as the art director at Bungie. And it's like, oh man, I, we were, we've all been so close. And like, this, this is what you were working for and seeing people meet those goals is like, LinkedIn can be a real dopamine kick every now and then. Yeah. You need to see people succeed and, and reach those, those heights that 
we kind of talked about. Yeah, I, my yeah, friend. That's so wonderful. My friend, yeah. my friend Anna Sweet from uh, College Vault Things just became president of Bad Robot uh, Games, and I was like, Oh, fantastic! Yeah, she's like, Yeah, well deserved because she has been busting ass for two decades. I love it. I love it, and and especially seeing obviously now in retrospect more females in these leadership roles and how how much that was lacking from my early days and my early development, not just as a like game tester or as a like game developer, but as a person. Like I didn't get a lot of female mentorship in the workplace because there wasn't a lot of female leaders until very late in my career. Uh, and it took a lot of a lot of time for me to even I think, recognize that. And that alone was like a real like punch in the gut. Like, wow, how did I, how could I have been so blind to this yeah. entire yeah. segment of the world? But then again, I was in the office for 70 hours a week and I kind of do what you do. Yeah. It's like a fishbowl culture. It, yes. Like, you're stuck and you see all the same people and they're also stuck there all the time. So you're not really getting anything from any outside sources. And I mean, even if you were interacting more with other people, society doesn't really um, like teach men about feminism or intersectionality or any of that kind of stuff. It's usually like feminism is for women. It is the domain of women, which is ironic because you need exactly. men to be a part of the movement if it's going to right. be effective. And it benefits yes. men too, but yes. no one told you you were supposed to think about it. So why would you? No. Yeah. I think the reasons why in retrospect I should have is how obvious it was. Mm. And the reason why I think I still have some semblance of like cynicism towards it is people making those sort of really, really high level important decisions at SOE are still in similar positions now. Yeah. And they never won't be. Yeah. And, and I remember when it, I was on WoW, it was basically Wendy, uh, who was head of 3D Dungeons and Environment mm -hmm. Art, and then a little later, Sarah Boolean in level design and that was about it for regular people I would contact on my half of the floor, right? There was a few others, yeah. but, you know, and you look back and you're like, oh, that was 100 people on a floor. And there were, you know, many more women that do it in line work, but two managers out of the 20, right, that were there, that's yeah. kind of like, whoa, that's one in 10. But, you know, yeah. when when you're just interacting with a few people every day and you're interacting with 10, 20 people all the time, and then you see another 10 once in a while, you just kind of normalized to it, right? Went yeah. to college and it was a tech college and it was normalized culture about oh, 10 yeah. to one guy girls, right? So you just get normalized yeah. to it. So I went to Blizzard. Of course it was the same. It's more of the same. Yeah. And you yeah, I grew up skateboarding and I went from skateboarding and playing D and D to the, like, these were like things like I was ashamed of like letting girls involved in the D and D and like skateboarding just in general had this, like there was a toxic culture back in the nineties of like girls don't skate. So it was, yeah, it just kind of continued on. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just still like thinking back now and realizing like, wow, we're 20 years later and yeah. why are we solving this now? Like, are, we aren't solving. Like, at least we're, we're talking about this now more. I'm aware of this more now. I try and bring these thoughts and these sort of emotions into the design work that I do. It's, it's, also become a part of my, like I said, my life because I'm a part of who I am. Like, because I went directly into games out of high school, I don't know any other industry really very well at all. What, what, so, what's a great example of something um, a female leader or colleague taught you that maybe you didn't have before, independent of the intersectionality, sexism, you know, issues um, that you learned and grew from, you can look back on, right? Because I think... I think a lot of one of the mistakes made is the belief that you need women just to teach you about that set section of stuff. But in truth, you learn a whole lot more from your female colleagues than that, right? Whether it's oh, insights absolutely. into you know organizational structure, community, game mechanics, yeah. whatever. 
Absolutely. Melissa Meyer would be one of the first people who comes to mind. She's just a brilliant mind to begin with. Yes. And to have the opportunity to work with her while she was in charge of developing the streaming battle in service. Um, my job was to then orchestrate the, the build a testing team to to work with her. Because to be perfectly honest, I didn't have the technical knowledge to to, to understand any of it. The guy, J.C. Park, who was building it, and a lot of the other people who were building that technology under Melissa's guidance and under Melissa's production skills, every single time I sat down there and had a meeting with her, it was like, man, that's how meetings are supposed to yeah. happen, dude. Yeah. Like, Melissa was a powerhouse, not, literal powerhouse. She, she knew what she was, and now she's an artist as well, and she's a brilliant artist. She can paint, so it's like, come on, man, leave some for the rest of us. Like, we just on the table, dude. Uh, but yeah, Melissa was brilliant. Kat Perry, who I, I worked with a lot, she was a peer of mine. She started out um, later than me, but grew into a real leader in QA, and uh is a person who now works, I believe, in uh, politics and uh, does mostly a lot of just like putting herself out there. And she helped humanize a lot of the policies that we were implementing that when I was first presented with them, my brain just rejected them outright as these are in these this isn't how you should manage people. This isn't how we should treat people. And maybe I'm kind of skipping ahead here. Maybe a little. Let's and let's actually go into a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's let's take a, take a breath on this, and um, yeah. let's go into some of the technical craft work of QA. Now, one, absolutely. One of the things that I was really lucky to see was when I went from you know in Blizzard, uh, QA was kind of like in its own floor and its own wing. It was kind of like over there, right? And mm -hmm. at the very end, they started bringing like five, ten QA people on floor. When I went to Riot, they actually had a mandate that you needed a QA person as a primary member of your team. So it would be engineer, art, um, you know, uh, program, sorry, engineer, art, uh, designer, QA, right? It was the core of most of the little pods that you would work in. And I really liked that because it treated them as, you know, equal tier citizens and ensured that QA was always informed both in the decision making process and in the testing process, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think a lot of people know the ins and outs of QA. So would you mind kind of just going through some of that day in the life insights type stuff? Yeah. And I, again, like I, I view myself as a person who had a, a very privileged QA experience. And I say that knowing like I got, I, I made very, very little money the entire time I did it. And, um, I survived paycheck to paycheck barely i had to have roommates the entire time in order to make it by and it's a tough gig because you're having to pay especially close attention to detail in documenting issues that you find and being able to communicate highly technical terms that you personally as an analyst may not have any sort of real experience with firsthand. Mm -hmm. You're just seeing it as a consumer would. So to try and have to learn a way to communicate cross-discipline, to be able to write down a bug that an artist is going to like to read and fix versus write down a bug that an engineer will actually read and fix yeah. or a, a designer sometimes maybe would fix <laughs> like, <laughs> no just kidding uh it's, it's, it's uh, true my, my job half the time was decide what we weren't going to fix so we didn't have time to get to it uh, so i feel you and that's and i i and i think the 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 real value of having qa around is to just poke you and say like dude this one really is important i promise this isn't a normal yeah. one this isn't just like the rest of them like this yep. one this one really means something uh and you have a, you gain this relationship with the product as a tester because especially like I, I got, I was lucky enough to work as a tester on StarCraft Ghost for a long time. Um, I say lucky even though 
go I, because no one else is really going to be able to play ghost and yeah. that was a fun it's a good yeah. game it was fun like it was really a fun fps sorry to say it guys is that a game that never, never released? released yeah it was done by never came out yeah, it was done by um, swing and ape right yeah yeah ratchet and clank um brilliant super fun multiplayer fps that me and a room of still to this day like 11 close friends we would sit in that room and we would test it. But if you were looking at it from an outsider's point of view, it looked like a bunch of kids playing a game <laughs> because we were. Mm -hmm. But through that process, we refined this game and we found all of the issues and we were able to actually sadly present enough information long term that, hey, this game's not making any progress. There was a whole lot of problems with Swing and Ape, and I don't want to. I had a bunch of friends who were on the team now, who are now in other places, but um, it had all of the typical problems from lack of lack of clear vision beyond the multiplayer. Right, multiplayer actually did, as you met, said, it was pretty fun, but they couldn't move forward with the, uh, the single player in an effective way, and they kept yeah. flip flopping between stealth mode and this run and gun, you know, play, you know, style. Ironically, looking back, right, if they had, they had two different characters, right, they had like your marine guy who was the run and gun sequences and you played Nova in the stealthy sequences and they made a clear snap back and forth. It might have worked, but they didn't have that, yeah. right? And the timing yeah. itself also was, by that point, we had reached the end of the 360s life cycle. Yep. Um, mm. So what can you do? I don't fault the decisions for what they were made. I would have made the exact same ones. I felt the exact same way, but I, I loved working on that game. The games that I had the most fun working on are the ones that either didn't come out or did the worst, <laughs> right? I love Planet Side to death. If people ask me to, to, to this day, what's my favorite game? I say Planet Side, but that game was broken. It was broken. full of bugs. Yeah. We launched with a Why? database that was just, I mean, I can't even, I, I couldn't even tell you. It was staggering. Yeah. So Planicide, to give a little context, was this very huge world. You'd pick a sector, you'd land in, you'd be on one of three factions, and you would just fight to take over these capture points. You could drive tanks and like, flying machines and, you know, motorcycles and yeah. all, whatever they were called in yeah. that game. It, was, it had a ton of stuff in it. Yeah. Um, and it was Massive. one of the first games that was massively open. It was like... Imagine battle royales running constantly across a old planet, and you're just being dropped into the border conflict, uh, and your progress decides how your border moves. It was really cool, but it was a massive technical hurdle in an era where massively multiplayer games, there was one that existed, right? And that was EverQuest, and then WoW came out, as, uh, and then Planet Side was somewhere in that timeline. And it's just mm -hmm. the tech wasn't there yet. It wasn't quite there. It wasn't quite there internally. It was flawless. It felt great, right? Yeah. Because no you didn't have to deal with the latency. You didn't yeah. have to deal with those issues. But we knew as players, as like lovers of the genre, if we didn't get this feel right, and as someone as a Blizzard alumni, I think feel and feel of a game like you know quality based on like within the first two seconds of touching a game, the game's quality. There's some sort of connectedness to it, and because we couldn't bring Planet Side to that level, I knew even though I worked harder on that game than any game I worked on subsequently, because of just the sheer number of hours I had to put into it that it wasn't going to be received well and that we were going to get kind of roasted on social media quite a bit. Um, and so my job then became reading bug report forums. Oh, man. And yeah. uh, that's a hard job. It can, it can eat at you, right? players, yeah. like... Players can like, be especially vitriolic, players right? Will yeah. you, right? They will, they will, like... And they're telling you basically, like, how did you miss this? How did you, how could you have possibly missed these issues? And you're just kind of like thinking to yourself, you're like, dude, I found that issue 16 months ago, bro. Like, Didn't that I know it's there. It's just we can't we sick. can't get it fixed. And the, either the reason we can't get it fixed is technical, it's it's fiscal, it's uh, priorities, it, it's a whole it's a whole gamut of reasons but i think you look at games that are truly successful long term they're the ones that typically work the best 
So why do you think it is that those games that didn't perform as well ended up being your favorites to work on? Probably because of that, right? Like, it's like that, that like, like, I know this is a good game. I know this could be better. I think that I wish or I see the potential that was there. Whereas in a lot of the other games, I feel like the potential was met. And I was very satisfied with the end result. So I see. I can say, like, yeah, I'm happy with that. Champions of the Norath, that's a really fun, solid package as a singular PlayStation 2 game, like dungeon crawl game. Fun. But Planet Side specifically, it just couldn't we couldn't get it done but i could still see and that's still the game that to this day i want to play but it yeah. it's not out there um and the subsequent attempts to make like planet side 2 and such um we're not we're not there yet um whether the tech's not there yet or just the i mean the mmo market is, is wild nowadays and with battle royales being what they are maybe that's kind of just Maybe we will see that in some form um, again, but uh, it was, these were also early days, and so it's probably a little bit of nostalgia, to be honest. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So. So you were working on QA, mm -hmm. and then eventually you moved up to another position. Yeah. So what was that, and how did that transition happen? It was a super rapid one and they they shipped me off to austin texas to work with jay allen brack on star wars galaxies wow um because i wrote a really scathing review of star wars galaxies <laughs> uh internally <laughs> they asked for our feedback and uh again i had never really been taught proper office etiquette i can write i never had trouble like expressing myself or putting words together and I tried to keep things professional but I basically said like the reason Star Wars Galaxies isn't doing well is because it like it's terrible and here's why and here's what I would do to fix it um and so they're like he thinks you can fix it like we'll send you out there to fix it then uh, it's like, oh, crap. Like, oh, <laughs> Hand you the gauntlet. Like, Congratulations. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. You're good proud job. Like, so now I'm sitting down in front of, like, I'm, I'm having meetings with Raph Koster and Jay Allen Brack, and these are, like, titans of the MMO industry. And I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to design anything. Like, I don't know the first thing about scripting. I don't know anything about balance design. Why am I here? Why? And then I kind of like, like, okay, yeah, now, well, Bill's my uncle, shit. Like, yeah, that makes sense. They probably think like, well, Bill's a really good designer. Maybe his nephew is too. Like, I'm not, like, I didn't show any aptitude. They never asked like, hey, do you know, are you good at scripting? Because we don't have any internal tools to build this stuff for you. You have to do it all by hand. And I was like, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> right like i just have ideas about how i think this game could be better in terms of a global like on a much more global scale from a usability point of view from a qa point of view so that kind of ended up with me then moving on to the, they're like well then since you don't really know how to script you seem like you can write why don't you write the jedi quests for us so i rewrote the, the jedi like how to become a jedi and I just wrote the Jedi quests, right? Um, and then we rolled that out along with the new game experience for Star Wars Galaxies, which I think John Smedley to this day says is, in his opinion, his single biggest career career failure. <laughs> oh was, gosh! Um, releasing the new the like the revamped Star Wars Galaxies um, to try and combat WoW's success. Uh, and so the failure of 
kind of planet side and seeing like the lack of QA being a part of the development process, knowing that we saw these issues, knowing that these issues weren't being resolved, seeing similar issues in Star Wars Galaxy's development and release, knowing that like, hey, we're finding bugs. They're bugs. Players don't like these. We should fix them. But players also like new content. And it's hard to convince people to fix old content instead of make new content sometimes. Yep. We were, we were really fortunate in how much of a quality mindset that existed at Blizzard, uh, right? Yes. That it was like, hey, no, cut it, clean it or cut it, right? And Exactly. I, I remember, like, and that was a valid thing, right? Hey, if you can't yep. deliver this, there was an entire extra third of a quest line that I had begun building for um, Green Fire for Warlocks. But it wasn't done, and there was no one else who really knew how to wrap it up. So when Chad came to it, he's like, I'm just going to cut it here and put a boss fight in instead that was really cool, and then just shipped it, right? And that was, I think, the correct decision, right? And, yeah. um, you know, I remember a couple of times, uh, right into the Wrath of Lich King and, Burning, and a little bit in Burning Crusade, where they were like, all right, this isn't here yet. We've got to make this better. Don't add new content, but we're going to go through all the old stuff for three months and we're just going to clean it up and see where we are yep. and then figure out what we need to Absolutely. finish this. Yeah. 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 And J Jason Hutchins was a champion yeah. for us. Yeah. He, he was. really was. Yeah. He, he, he sat there and he would, he would listen to us and, and we weren't always the most mature in our delivery <laughs> and yeah, the sometimes it was like, but he, he was there and I feel like as a result of that, like I never on the WoW team felt like anything. I didn't feel lesser than in any other way, except for the fact like when bonuses rolled around <laughs> and like across the street, people had new cars. And I was like, cool. I don't have to worry about rent so much. Oh, that's painful. Like, dude, I literally like new, like second new Lotus of the year. Like that hurts to see. Yeah. That's when crazy. you're like paycheck to paycheck. Cause they're they're also yeah. like you're you're eating lunch with them. <laughs> you're right there. But you're also like destitute almost in Orange County. Oh yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Orange County was brutal. I remember when I started. It was brutal in the yeah. early days. I started at they started me at eight dollars and fifty cents an hour at Blizzard. That was down from uh Sony where they had you at nine, right? Exactly. But then when I got full-time status, they gave me $11, which was three months later. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed at that for, I, no, dude, I went like, I got my 5% increase for, until finally I was able to, through seniority, through tenure, through time, work my way up through the ranks of QA again. Because I kind of, I left SOE um, thinking I was maybe done with the industry. Yeah. Thinking that like, it was done. This was hard. Yep. I can't do this, but uh, I didn't know anything else. And when the call to work on World of Warcraft came, like, of course, I was like, yeah, dude, sure. Why not? It's the best game that's out right now. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to go work on it. Um, and when I saw QA being treated differently and I saw the actual relationship between QA and development, uh, was a lot healthier at Blizzard. I felt a lot more fulfilled there and was able to work there much longer and um, feel like I had a bigger impact on the games that I worked on at Blizzard than I did at Sony, even though some of those Sony games are still I, closer. I remember when I worked on uh, Shade of Iran, which was the first boss fight I got to make myself, yeah. right? All the abilities, yeah. all the planning, all the executions. And I actually got to call up the QA team that was doing testing, I'm like, hey, can you get 10 people together right now, jump on my server, play it? And they did that. And I would go down the stairs and I'd walk down the stairwell and be like, hey, yeah. how is this? And they'd be like, well, this doesn't make any sense. And I'd go upstairs, like, hang on, change like six things. I'm like, okay, try it again. And we yeah. did, I think like, so I didn't know how you were supposed to access for QA time, right? So I just called people and I'm like, can we just do this, right? And so I'd go down there and we would do like 10 play tests and they'd be like, hey, we got to get back to work. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And the next week I'd be like, all right, can we do it again? But that yeah. fight, because of that yeah. steady flow of feedback and the iteration cycles, 
actually probably was one of the tightest encounters in Karazhan, right? Not in terms of maybe polish, I was still a new developer, but like the oh, balance, right. the timing, <laughs> yeah. the pacing, it all oh, worked out, brilliant. right? Was that Morgan Bay you were working with? Uh, it was Morgan and um, a few others. I'm blanking. I can see all their faces. Um, yeah, I want to say Dan. I, I, that's I want to say it was yeah. Morgan. It was Dan. It was um, at least two others. There's this guy who always smoked. Oh, Sean. Sean. Sean Sue. Sean. Sean. Sean Sue's the yeah. Well, Sean. Sean Sue's my my 100% mentor, godbrother, li lifelong friend. Uh, he. Yeah, he, he sent me like, wow, <laughs> year cards for my wedding present. Aww. Like, he's, Sean, I love Sean Sue to death. He's my absolute favorite person. Um, and he's he's still a QA at Blizzard and um, is an absolute champion. Like, absolutely love that guy. And, uh, but, That's but that was the cool. thing, right? Was, and then when eventually I had someone come to my office, like, hey, you can't just ask QA to do things. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and um, I look back at it, and my, my next four fights sucked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? like, it was like, I, I was like, yeah, like, I'm like, am I really this bad now? But like, you know, yeah. it was like Nether Spite was like, it was a really a hit or miss fight, depending on which character race you were. And I, I was not about me, but um, <laughs> it just shows how valuable that feedback flow is for the people who are actually engaging with your content. Yeah, yeah, because they love it. They they truly do. Like that's why they're there, and so they want to. Sh they they share that experience, or they try their best to share that experience. But it's a it's a hard path, and there's a lot of resistance on that path because your job is to tell someone else that they're doing their job wrong. Yeah, or having and yeah. yeah, yeah, the tone that you put into that is typically textual, right? Right. It's through a database. It's very clinical. Clinical. And you don't, it's a, there's another person on the other side of this. And I've had some comments written by developers on bugs that I wrote. Oh that yeah. Cut you to the core. Oh yeah. Like I have one, one that sticks through to me to this day was closing this bug out. Another tester pretending to be a designer. Yep. What? Why would they say that to you? Because it it's wasn't job. my job. It, it wasn't my job to give him the type of the bug I wrote wasn't great, and he wasn't far off base in what he was saying. But at the same time, both of us needed to recognize that we were communicating with a human. Yep. And so when he writes something like that, like. I remember it 10 years later, <laughs> like. Uh, That's a really passive aggressive way to communicate that idea. He could have said the same idea, but in a way that was a lot more constructive. Like, hey, yeah, thanks honestly, for Honestly, he could have flagged 50 bugs this. with the same thing. Yeah, like. Yeah, like, this isn't the kind of uh, feedback we're looking for, thank you, but can you please focus on this kind of stuff instead? Just something that's not so mean. That's like cruel. I, I know that that's the shock. Here's let's just play, take the other side of this for a moment. And I know that's mm -hmm. unpleasant, right? Yeah. But the other guy on the other side of this is looking at a wall of 200 bugs, right? And he's going through them and he's like, which do I have to hit? And there's one in here. It's like, hey, I think it would be better if this was like this, which should have been an email, but a couple of things. QA people weren't supposed to directly email developers, which I didn't even know unless they mailed them first weird until unless you like leads or something no, um, yeah, do right not. remember and uh, i remember that you couldn't even instant message someone on a development team mm -hmm. if you were in customer service or qa oh, unless it was pre-approved which is yeah. low blew my mind because i would just i could just message from people. customer service just up to qa they had to go through approval too and i'm like man that's our best resource of course, yeah so it's like hey that's my best resource for bugs like like, like for my oh, team oh is yeah the people talking to the customer. Yeah, but just, but just to give the other side, right? You're looking at a wall of 200 bugs and you're just like, which ones do I have to deal with? And I have to reassign them, I have to figure out what's there. And sometimes it's just like, <sighs> you know, they, they're human beings too, right? You got us, you have frustrated, tired, exhausted human beings on both sides of this formula. Exactly. So could, could they have written something better? Yes, absolutely. Did, did they just get frustrated because they had 30 bugs that were just like that, right? Totally. And that was because the communication pipelines weren't for humans, right? They were, weren't there. they weren't, they weren't set up in a way they'd be like, Hey, here are some suggestions for you to review. Eventually they did have that suggestion section, 
But then you had, mm -hmm. had to decide, is this a developer who's going to read through their suggestions or just close them all out at the end of the quarter, right? Exactly. That's hard. Yeah. Like what, where, how do, and how as a developer, can you truly prioritize that? Like you are hired for your job because of your talents and skills in this specific field. Yep. A tester is not. A tester is hired for their ability to break or manipulate those systems. However, through time and experience, they accumulate testers skill. do gain yeah. a lot of knowledge on those systems. So they become a really great resource for the developers to use. But testers can and will and do also overstep their boundaries and in their path towards becoming something else. Because not a lot of people sit down and say, like, I'm QA for life because they don't make like Blizzard tries and is trying to make it a, a real career path, but not a lot of the other companies have said like let's let's make her QA a, a full track career, career path, path. that's yep. respectable yep. because the room for automation, the room for developing good QA and making games that just work, it, like it's not an unknown science. It's it's regimented, it's strict checklist development and integrated teams, yeah. right? And Riot does it. The reason Riot does it so well is because a lot of their producers used to be Blizzard QA. Damn straight. And uh, right? yeah, and it, and it shows, right, that they brought these lessons like, hey, we want to make things better here, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other thing, like, also that, that interaction, right, the, you know, QA overstepping their bounds and so on. Um, you know, it was a problem with young designers too. They would just listen to everybody's feedback and do everybody's thing, right? And then they would spin in circles because they'd just be spinning on feedback instead of saying, no, here's where we have to put a flag in the ground and keep moving forward too. Yeah. So, you know, and that, that's just part of organizational aging and maturity too. Yeah, um, very much so. But I, I think one of, the, one of the saddest moments looking back for me was um, there was times I would just, you know, I, I was a... I moved to California for effectively to work in the games industry, right? I ended up thrown into, you know, a design job as my first real job out of um, you know, college, right? And um, I didn't really know any people. And I'm like, who do you socialize with? You, know, you don't know the senior people on your development team. So I spent a lot of time social with QA. And then like, over time, you know, people who are at mid-level and senior, just, you know, I, I won't name names, would pull me in and like, Alex, you need to be careful how you're perceived. Uh, you're socializing so much with QA. And I saw all the pictures of those parties. You're hanging out with all of them. And, and that, that was like, that's scary, right? You're like, oh God, what is, am I doing something wrong? Am I, and in my mind, I was fostering relationships, and getting to know people, and maybe I made mistakes, right? But, you know, but it, it was, it's one of those things, right? Where it's that, what do you do as a young person when that's the pressure put on you, right? Do you, yes. like, what do you do? Um, you... Yeah, a lot of the times you do exactly what the person who is in charge of you kind of tells you to do. And sometimes those, luckily I've had a lot of really positive mentors who push me in good directions, but there have been opportunities in the past where I've recognized like, wow, I could go this way instead. I could go to the cigar lounge after work instead. Yeah. That's a faster track to where I want to go, but I don't want to go that route. Yeah. I, so I didn't. I remember. I remember there was what they called the the smoking club, right? Which is like three certain yeah. people. No, that was a real thing. It's like, a I'm real not thing. And, they would, hide things. and this one guy yeah. would, would say, "Oh, I go out there and I I smoke." I'm like, "I didn't know you smoke." He's like, "I don't, except when I'm standing don't. with there with A, B, and C." And I'm like, "Ah, oh, shit," you know. Um, I didn't want any part of that, but um, you know, I'm like, that's too far for me. Um, yeah, but, you know, BlizzCon became very similar to be to be perfectly frank because I, I did a lot of BlizzCon um, work in terms of staffing and in terms of building that up. And so yeah. one of my last responsibilities before leaving BlizzCon was staffing, or before leaving Blizzard rather, was staffing BlizzCon. Sure. Um, I remember wait, were you, fifty people. Were you one of the people behind the every developer needs to be uh, at, yes. at, at this booth Absolutely. at some point, right? I made I liked it. That. I put my yeah. flag in, like my. I put my like that was something that I was not going to back down from. I talked to Alicia Cabrera, who yeah. I still to this day respect and love. She she's an events yeah. guy, like God. She runs events, and I think. Her and Laura Halasa. Laura's oh, at Warner Halasa, Brothers yeah. now. And it was great. Alicia, I think, is at, like at Nike or something huge. Like she's she's running big stuff. Um, maybe Samsung. Um, 
either way, like getting to learn from these people about events management and staffing. And I, I was a personnel manager at the time, so I was mostly doing hiring and just staffing and stuff. But yeah, I wanted to make sure developers needed to understand that they're not, they're not rock stars, man. Like yeah. get out there on the floor. Like we're all working really hard here and I'm having to hire 250 like bolt staff people off of the street that don't care about our games, don't care about our customers, don't know anything about gaming and are here to collect a paycheck. And that's not who we want to represent this company at this event. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so it, I, I wanted to make it clear, but that man developers did not like that. Well, I mean, it was, it was shocking, right? Because it was, um, it was a case thing, right? Oh, there, yeah. there's the players down here and then there's your testers and then your staff and then your developers and then your president, right? Or so whatever, or your gurus, right? And, yeah. um, you know, if you were suddenly asked to do things down, it was weird, but I liked it. I liked, like, you remember, I liked posting on forums. I liked oh, talking dude, to players. I loved, yeah. I liked those moments. Like, oh, I'll, it was like an hour. It was one hour. You show up on the exactly. floor, you talk to the players, exactly. you get to see what excites them. And then sometimes they're just kind of like, eh, they play it and they go and you just learn. But yeah, a and, lot of the old- And that one hour of time saved a QA person from having to work every single day of the show and not attend themselves yeah so they could then go because to the that was themselves. what we were some some people were having to do they were having to give up their own attendance day to work it because we couldn't get uh. enough staff even after we put in the mandate some people were kind of like above the mandate unfortunate i mean so, i mean if you're running blizzcon I take a pass, right? And then, or if you're international, fine. But you know, all right, whatever. Yeah, like, right, they, like there, there's you have to be reasonable. On. There, like, are, there you, are limits. Yeah, right. exa- dude. And there are people who are they have their own like BlizzCon itself and the crunch running up to it. It, it was Brutal. intensive, right? Brutal, yeah. It's a it's a really big event. Um, and I think a lot of people maybe outside of the industry don't think of E3 or BlizzCons as being periods of intense pressure beforehand, but man, you go through a lot of rapid development during those periods and you go into the, those those big events pretty tired. So for those who don't know, can you explain a little bit about what an event like BlizzCon or E3 is actually like behind the scenes? Um, it's a lot of... I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, there's, there's a lot of like, kind of like taking people aside and letting them cry and listening to them because <laughs> bad stuff happens in big conventions. And when you have employees who are responsible for trying to oversee lots of this type of stuff, you have to have really complicated conversations. And I can't go into a lot of details about specifics, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's really, really rough. And anytime you go from a, like a person like myself, where I had a staff of 20 employees, which is already more than I could realistically manage to having 250 people that I had to try and schedule, that was impossible. And so Sean Sue was the one who really, really did it. Yep. Sean Sue was the one who really took the reins and built the structure that I was able to mold into and build a team with and through Alicia then get these events to actually happen. So I think what it looks like behind the scenes is what a lot of game development looks like behind the scenes. It's a lot of building checklists and then following those checklists until every single thing is done to the best of your abilities. And you have and know that you're assigning the right people to the right jobs. Um, And then it's a lot of just like, timing and making sure that that timing is um locked down like ahead of time a little bit and just good to go it's hard i don't know it's hard so, it's hard to kind of all encapsulate it into so, like a sound bite okay so we've had a lot of tough conversation type topic stuff here what was one of your proudest moments at blizzard and then let's hear a bit about where your transition into um, art and other things started and how that how you grew those skills Okay. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I don't want to, like, the, Blizzard was wonderful to me, and my experiences there, for the most part, were fantastic. So, like, 
Sorry if it's been a down. <laughs> but okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, go through your story. Yeah, yeah, I would say like uh, in terms of like my proudest moment at Blizzard, it would it would be probably the launching cataclysm. Mm. I think I was I was QA I was QA assistant lead at the time on cataclysm, and. Paul Carver was lead and Michael Corpora was assistant. Now like Mike Corpora is big up at Amazon game studios. Now like a lot of these other guys are, and we were working so hard and like, we had such a cool team with like Morgan was on our, on raids. And uh, so Morgan day and his brother, Travis, you were just talking about, like we were just like, it was this like, team that felt so tight and so well organized that there wasn't a feature that the designers or production could come at us with that I felt like we weren't like immediately able to react and build appropriate test environments and like get them results right away. It was just like a, like a real golden era and it it worked really i felt like it worked really well and i felt like the the launch my memories of launches are kind of not great because i've been through a lot of them but i hope it was smooth um probably wasn't in retrospect because launches rarely are but yeah. um cataclysm and launching cataclysm was it was a proud moment for me i, I really really did now that launch was that the phase where they had the uh, technical QA, right? The dedicated QA engineering, yeah. right? That was the one where they actually exactly. gave like a team of like. I remember they had a mixture of a couple people with experience and then a bunch of people who were QA people. That they lifted up by yep. engaging with technical skills, giving them access exactly. to all the scripting, right? I remember Dan Kramer gave some advice when he was exactly. doing internal testing. Dan Kramer, right? Yeah. Fucking Kramer, man, that guy. God, he automation was testing, brilliant. right? Yeah, brilliant. Um, Just numbers, man. And like, and that, talk about a person who loved WoW, like yeah. loved WoW and loved games and was just a pleasure to, to work with at all times. But, loved Dan Kramer. But, but actually having your own resources to engage and things you needed, tools built with, whether it's Lewis scripting yep. or testing yep. stuff, right? Exactly. It was transformational for you guys because yeah. rather oh, than being did. engaged in a priority battle with development and a developer has to stop with their, their because developers at the end of the day, they're driven by making new things or improving the things that are there, right? Yeah, and and having someone it. else who said like, no, I'm here to make QA life better. And I know because I was QA that I want to make their lives better. And I speak exactly. the language I'm integrated in, right? That was just transformational. It, it was it was huge and it was necessary because the technology was becoming so advanced when it came to testing testing a game that's being in the process of it installing itself like yep. becomes infinitely more complex uh, while that installer is building itself while you're playing the game it becomes even more complex um, these were all technologies that never existed before um and the that they still like just absolutely blow my mind when i sit down and think about the technology that they were developing over in battlenet at the time and the tools that like dan rob martin was a big part of that Orb. push as well yeah yep Orb. he's uh been he was at high res for a long time he's gotten big into ui design i believe i'm not sure where he is at the moment he may be back at high res um but yeah, Rob, Rob was crushing it. He was building these, like we had these checklists that we would have to run through and it would take these just massive amounts of man hours. But Rob was brilliant enough to be like, dude, no, we'll build a bot. Yep. We build bots yep. to do this stuff all day long. Yep. Like, why do we have you sitting here trying to find this stuff when I can make a bot do it for us? And we're like, oh, bro, of course, please. <laughs> Transformative. Exactly. And, and it, all it took was someone having the faith in in Rob and having the faith in that team and the technical engineering team to say like yes you're worthy of taking the time to build these because we we know it's worthwhile and Michael Gilmartin who was in charge of QA at the time was uh, was behind that and I, I respect him for making those decisions and definitely Sean Sue was was right there and Mark Mosier and Ed Kang and just a lot of really really 
great QA guys that I look at as friends still to this day. And I want to say like the change there was a change in trust, right? Those scripting functions, yeah. those features, they existed. It was then saying here, they're turned on. You guys can access them. You, you can make them that. as part of your workflow. If you need a few little tweaks, we'll throw things up development for the most part, we're going to do it in house. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was it. It was a trust thing because before that was all these locked down builds and limited commands. And I remember I wrote the goddamn QA debug <laughs> menu for, yes. uh, on Thank the wow you. team. Right. And Thank you. And I like, yes. I like, well, first one, I'm sure they revised it before it got to you guys, but, uh, but regardless, the, the, like, green bar, sure. the green bar yeah. and you just have a word, yes. you click on it and show other words and you could spawn things or kill that things was or whatever. Massive. Yeah. A massive improvement over what we were doing before, which was command. just like looking at yeah. CM on command create line. monster it insane, one. Right? I remember it's CM insane. monster three zero 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 was my test monster. T test monster? Yeah, was that your specific? <laughs> yeah, one? my specifically. Yep, yep. That my trust was an orc yeah. warlock, and you would just sit there and cast whatever spell I was <laughs> testing hopelessly. <laughs> I want to ask you about one more thing. Yeah. I'm changing the subject a little no bit, problem. but it's just because we're we're already running out of time. I think we could probably have a whole other episode with you <laughs> about um, your time as an artist, but I was just hoping that we could hear sort of the beginning of that story and just how you then transferred over from what you were doing at the time to then becoming a concept artist. Because if my internet snooping was correct, that's sort of where, what you consider yourself now, right? Is a yeah. concept artist? Yeah, I've been working as a concept artist now professionally for five years um, with Lego for two and a half years now um, as a subcontractor. So it was a transition that I needed to make personally that was rooted um, in, I. I ended up in a position in QA where I was a personnel manager and I was in charge of hiring and firing and giving performance evaluations. And I'm not, I don't have the personality type to be able to do that. <laughs> and it, yeah. it, it crushed me. Um, and so to be real, I had been and always have suffered with anxiety and depression, so take medications as a result of it. Uh, during one of these periods where I was just struggling with like, man, I have to score someone who has a four or five in communication and neither one of those numbers means anything because I can't give the person I want the scores I want because I'm limited in the number of scores I can give out. It was all just so, it's just like, it, like the curtains just like crashed in front of me and this whole like facade of like, who works hard and what are we working hard for made me kind of like have a bit of a breakdown. And I took myself off of my uh, medication, which is no one should ever, ever do that. Always okay. listen to your doctors and always take the medications as they're prescribed. Um, yeah. I didn't, and I took myself off and kind of just couldn't keep functioning. So I cashed in my 401k and thought I was going to move to Costa Rica to basically uh, surf and draw. I didn't have goals outside of that. I also didn't have a very big 401k, so like that wasn't reasonable. So what ended up happening was um, a lot of like white privilege where I call mom and dad and I'm like, hey, I'm in bad shape. I don't know what to do. And they, they were living on the East Coast at the time. And I came back and luckily they were there. And um, I explained to them like, hey, I'm, I'm in a bad spot. I don't really know what I want to do, what makes me happy. And I'm obviously not doing it now. Uh, so here I am <laughs> and they, to their credit, uh, had a lot of patience and a lot of understanding and had the resources to support me for a little while and put me into a place where I was able to like physically put me into like a, they bought a home that I moved into and rented from them and for fees that were something that I could afford. And I basically, my dad was like, you never went to college. 
but we had some college savings for you. So this is your college savings. Do you think you can be an artist? Do it. And so at that point, I had about a year and a half to just kind of grind and not have to worry about a whole bunch else. And the internet is a wonderland of resources. And I truly feel like there isn't a skill set out there, at least in games, that you can't teach yourself with a bunch of Google searches. And so that's what I did. And I, the only reason I knew art was where I wanted to go and art was the path that I took was working with Shane Dabiri for a while. Um, Shane Dabiri is a person who I consider to be, again, another one of my like mentors and a person who I've looked up to and admired for a very long time. And I was working with him as a production assistant on Overwatch for a while. And he saw me interacting with the artists like Gino Whitehall and Mark Brunet and Pure Oberson and these just like artists of just the calibers were just astronomical. Peter Lee was these these oh yeah they are titans right they were the people who did the art that was like lining the walls like when you got in the elevators like it was and i was writing their tasks i was putting their tasks into the database and having conferences with them about like hey how's your day going like and he was like i don't see people talk with artists like we don't like this isn't normal right <laughs> you like this like you really love this but you don't yeah like being a producer and I, he was right like and uh he picked instead of taking me on for that role full-time he hired timothy ismay who is again oh, a brilliant yeah. dude who's a great strong producer, producer mm -hmm. strong producer way better producer than i would have been and so that moment i realized like okay, I've been working really hard to become a producer and like the best producer I know just told me I'm not going to be a good producer. Like that's, yeah. I should figure some shit out. And uh, what I, what I wanted to do was find a career eventually where time didn't matter anymore. I was so sick of time being a factor. And so time meaning like looking at a clock or paying attention to like anything like that. I wanted to be able to meditate through work, <laughs> like find work yeah. that was meditative. And the one thing that I've done in my life outside of music that's been meditative is art. Art's always been my go-to. I, I draw instinctively and always have. Didn't draw well, but I just did it. And so, and I think I was too immature for a very long time to understand that in order to get good at art, you have to actually like learn. Yeah. <laughs> like it's a skill, mm -hmm. right? You, like, like I, I, for some reason, like I thought it was magic, right? But I have a, my best friend's a plumber. And I say this to all of my friends nowadays, like there is no difference between the path I took to being an artist and the path he took to being a plumber. He learned the skills the mm -hmm. same way I did. His skills are just as hard. He has to think just as creatively. He's it's it's just his smells a lot worse and like his physical. <laughs> like, I've smelled some like, oil paint, sir. I don't know if I agree with you. And that's very true. But I work digitally exclusively. Uh, so, like, I don't mess with any of that messy stuff. Like I keep my fingers fairly clean. Uh, so it's it's interesting how people talk about skill versus talent and how some sort of groups of um, of skills are. Like the art, the artistic ones are grouped as talent, uh, as if you're just born with the ability. And I mean, I do believe people have natural inclinations for things, but it really is just developing and cultivating a skill set. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing I've always said, right, the difference between um, skill, talent, right, is just how easily that hunger and willingness to get past the pain of the skill development is to get to the other side. Right? Because you're you're you're, so you're facing a wall, and that wall is covered in spikes and thorns and sharp things. If you want to get over it more than you want to not have to experience the pain of going through all those moments along the way, you're going to get over it, right? Um, and and talent is just the 
is when people don't see the, the, the is when people don't see the thorns, but they see the person climb over the other side, right? And skill development yeah. is every single painful step or trimming of every single thorn in order to make it easier for you to get over that cliff. Um, you know, and, yeah. I, yeah. and for me, right, art is one of those things where there is not, I enjoy drawing and scribbling and things like that, but I do not have that hunger and compulsion to push myself through the really painful steps of getting shading right and learning for the right way to convey perspective become that kind of artist right i just i just know myself at this point and i can go back and like oh maybe it's because of this random thing in my past whatever um that's not where it is but sit me down with a player experience problem and a series of trade-offs and i am in my power play zone right i'm like exactly. happy to do it and I, yeah. that's how you felt right when you got to that point and you were looking at the wall ahead of you and just started plunging up it um figuring out how to get better at art yeah, basically, it's the exact same thing. And I, I think I had that similar experience when I ran into that wall with production or I ran into that wall with design earlier in my career while I was in QA trying out the rest of the industry or maybe even a little bit into events planning and personnel management. And I realized like, no, those thorns aren't aren't for me. Like I they're not they're not they're not the rewarding kind. They're not the kind that I'm like like I, I don't I don't want it. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. And I, yeah. I, art, you're right. Like it was hard, but some part of my brain latched on yep. and said like, nah, it's cool. Keep doing it anyways. And <laughs> I had a very, very supportive peer group and family and just network of people in the games industry who despite the fact that I was posting embarrassing, embarrassing drawings were so supportive and so kind and so like generous with their time. Mm -hmm. And some of those guys who I worked with on Overwatch, uh, like when I would send them the first messages, like, hey, dude, what do I do? How do I, how do I do this thing? Like, how do I do this art shit? Like. I still follow that advice that they give me at that first time, which is like, have as much fun with it as possible. And, and like, I've been very lucky and that, that has panned out eventually, but I can understand how for a lot of struggling artists out there who are working to get their first placements in those first like few breakthrough roles, like it's a challenge. And my first few gigs were very, very low paid, like Paizo illustrations for Pathfinder and stuff like that. And you would think like, wow, Paizo, like Pathfinder, like that's a big publisher, like, but they paid me like 150 bucks for a painting. Mm -hmm. It took me like three days to do. Yep. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh no, I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> Uh, I might need I to, relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I need to go back to QA because <laughs> that at least paid something. Um, but I got a part-time yeah. job at Barnes & Noble stocking shelves. Like, and I was happy doing that because I, I love books. It was great. So I did that and made enough money. I live in a much, much cheaper part of the country now. I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which isn't my first choice, but I bought my first home here now. Like I was right able choices. to buy a home, which mm -hmm. as a native Californian seems like ludicrous. Oh, yeah. Like that's an impossible absurd. dream. Yeah. I've never even like, no, that's homes are for other people. Um, yeah. But I've been able to do that here. And um, this, this week, like not just the jinx things, I've had two companies, both major triple a giant companies reach out with their recruiters like and they're the recruiters from the company so like big nice cool fun steps in the future like it's exciting yeah that's that's really awesome ryan and um thank you so much for sharing your experiences today oh it's my pleasure i love it yeah no very much so i was gonna say ryan thank you so much for bringing all of these, you know, uh, moments of what you experienced, the humility and the willingness to share all of this stuff. And, you know, I'm really, really glad that you brought up Shane because Shane is one of those great examples of one of those people who 
will tell you things as he sees it in the kindest way possible and didn't back down for conversations about mental health or his experiences or things he's grown through. Um, and I'm really glad that he, like me, I had a different, mm -hmm. right? But it was there to be a fulcrum for that moment and just help you see where you were because uh, that can make all the difference. And really good. That, that, that joy of, of just those moments of mentorship. And if, if you're ever, not just you, but to the audience, if you're ever, you know, in a position where you see someone, you just see like, it seems like they're just slightly missing their path. And a moment of kindness to be like, hey, what, what, what's keeping you from this step over here? Don't hesitate to at least put it out there gently, right? Do it with kindness and warmth because you don't know how just one conversation saying, hey, I believe in you. I think you could do it. I, I remember um, a friend of mine was, wanted to be um, kind of a streamer and a voice actor. And I'm like, wow, you... You have the personality for you to do both of those things really well. And they looked at me shocked. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah. Ask anyone in this room and they'll tell you the same thing. And and went on to do a whole bunch of major roles. And now they're featured in Apex Legends. Do you Love give it. that moment to someone else, right? Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. It's, there's there's And there's plenty of opportunities for it, too. There's so many people out there looking for this type of instruction, looking for this type of help. So just be kind. That's a great message. Be kind. <laughs> just be nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have any social media handles or any projects that you'd like us to plug and put in the description down below? Um, not particularly. No, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you can find my stuff by just uh, Googling Ryan Trost. Uh, I'm on ArtStation, like the rest of the concept artists out there. Luckily, my name is spelled relatively uniquely, so it's kind of easy to find me. Um, but outside of that, I, I'm really happy with my current projects on LEGO and, and excited to be able to finally, hopefully, release some of my first like NDA artwork, because it's piling up now yeah. <laughs> and my social media is yeah. kind of dormant. Uh, yeah. Like that, that's one of the things that I didn't recognize going into art as a career. I, I recognized it, but I wasn't really prepared. Like you turn your hobby into your, what you do for all day long. Well, now what, what do you do as a hobby <laughs> instead? Yep. Like, so, uh -huh. so balance, finding a good balance and, and preventing myself from, from stretching myself too thin by like drawing, even though I'm, kind of not working i've been trying to keep that yeah. in check a little bit more lately and just enjoy it all, all right, so, well, no, one, no plus, just right. having fun. one last little thing um i'm gonna share one of my uh recent terrible drawings because um why not here is my lovely frog <laughs> look at him it's Here, not terrible and, at all and i just want to throw this, this out to the people out there who maybe <laughs> your journey isn't to get to you know find concept artist if you enjoy doing something and you just enjoy scribbling, I, I just feel like five minutes, right? But you know what? It's okay to enjoy something too, right? Okay. Assuming it's not, you know, hurting other people, of course, but you know, go ahead and enjoy things and be bad at things and let people see that, hey, yes. eh, I made this, this was fun. I don't care that it's yes. not good. And exactly, it will make you happy. It's full of joy, and it's, that makes it beautiful. And it it's makes little tough. me happy as a result. It makes other people look at happy. I feel as that's that's how I've taken on to music, right? Like right now, like all of this stuff, mm -hmm. the music, no one will ever hear it, but I mm -hmm. I make a lot of it every day, and it's exclusively for me, and mm -hmm. it's it's just for the joy of it. It's just therapy. That's awesome. It's wonderful. All right, well, audience, if you have any questions for Ryan or for Alex or me, leave them in the comments down below. And if you like this kind of comment or like this kind of content, uh, remember to like and subscribe so that you can see more of us in the future. Maybe we'll be lucky and get Ryan to come on again. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Anytime.